ambiente ha sin da subito apprezzato perché è proprio un richiamo a riconnettersi con la natura. Quindi ringraziamo tantissimo eh, Antonio Caschetto, speriamo di rivederci ancora ad Assisi magari un'altra volta. E now we'll turn to English. Antonio, if you want to stay, you are very welcome. Uh, because now we have some uh, guests that maybe uh, you know, I don't know, but they are participants of one of the biggest events that uh, happened uh, online also uh, this year, that was Economy of Francesco. Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, uh, Annalisa Spallazzi, that uh, is one of the like coordinators of the uh, Italian villages and Italian hubs, then Annalisa will explain a little bit better uh, what uh, uh, the hubs is. And uh, uh, Nurul Ajnat Ove, that uh, is also the speaker for the next session. Hi, Nurul, welcome. And he's also participated to the, uh, to the economy of Francesco. So I'll give the floor to Annalisa to a little bit explain what the economy of Francesco has been, what are the hubs, so what's moving on there? Hi, hi Domingo and good morning everyone. So yes, thanks for having me here. I will just tell a little bit on my point of view on the experience, because actually we have been more than 2,000 youth around the world, so it's kind of uh, challenging to try to explain the point of view of everyone. But yes, so what could be told about what has happened and what will continue actually, because as uh, Domenico was saying, this has been in the end uh, an online event, even if it was supposed to be gathering all the 2000 youth in Assisi, but then it turned to be really a, a process. So we have been starting to be connected since March and was really the, this need from everyone that we were supposed to meet in March to say, okay, how we can meet even if we are not seeing in person. And this has happened through the 12 villages that were organized and those were organized in terms of having all those people just dividing on uh, different groups during the event. And then it turned out to be the aggregation space where everyone from around the world could gather together. So they were going from the energy and poverty, women for economy, business, or even on policy and happiness. So several topics. Personally, I've been part of the CO2 of inequalities one as is also the one that I care the most in terms of topics and work-wise and also personal-wise. And I've been having really the chance to work uh, with people from all over the world. And we, really, the, I think that one of the things that is more personal to be shared is also how was finding the time that was fitting for everyone from India, South America and Africa to try to really be connected. So we were connecting like at 8 Rome time, that was 1 p.m., 1 a.m. in uh, India, but was also morning in uh, South America, but really to try to connect and work together. And what we have been doing was to split also in the village in different topics. And we, I, I was involved, for example, in the writing of uh, a concept note for a publication, but there were also launching of projects like the House of Fraternity. And these are all now em embryonal projects that are going to be implemented for next year so that we will have them to present by the, by the hopefully in-person meeting in Assisi. So really a lot happening in terms of villages and I know that there are a lot of those parallel streams that were happening. There is also, for example, a publication that was done from, uh, from, from the work and care group on how to implement the Franciscan way of working in the usual job. So that's also super interesting. So really a lot of content and a lot of willingness to, to move on. And in parallel, this is the global, let's say uh, that we have been part of, but we have also been starting in Italy and also in the other countries, local hubs that were the gathering of the national or local context. In Italy in particular, we are the majority because we are 500 and there has been started a process called Cammini di Prossimità, which means the proximity paths. And through that, every region has been starting this process on what we can do actually locally. So it's good to be part of this global movement. We want to really be part of it. But then what does it mean in practice if we want to do something locally? And that's how it has burned this, uh, this process on saying, I want to know, even if I don't know when we will be able to meet, because sometimes really we are not even meeting also in the region, which is the group I'm part of. But we want to do something that is connected to what we can impact on. And we started this way and we, uh, like in, in uh, Emilia Romagna, we are 
collaboration also with the hub uh, of territory, the hub, uh, hub del territorio. So to really bring together businesses and the youth and no novelty idea on how we can make business more close to what is the economy of Francesco. It really depends on what is the real need of every region, because we have also a lot of differences despite being whole in Italy. So have, you can see now also when we are sharing among ourselves in the different regions, how different is also the the approach because of what we are needing to do. And the idea is also now to try a way in which we can gather together because in Italy we have 20 regions. So if everyone is developing projects but we are not knowing each other to maintain this vision and mission of the economy of Francesco is also difficult. So now we are trying as well to be connected at national level and to see what we could do as a common path kind of uh, guidance. And this could be kind of a Franciscan rule, let's say that we can everyone follow to implement this project on the ground. So it has been really a start. The international event has been the inspiring moment, the moment where we could be inspired by the by the experts, but the process of uh, working together was already started and is continuing. And last meeting for me was yesterday with the <laughs> group of the CO2 of inequality, and I'm sure there will be several others coming on. So a uh, really, really inspiring and uh, enriching experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annalisa. And as I said before, uh, we have with us also Norul. Hi, Norul, welcome. And he's a, a speaker or, or about education, but also he participated to the economy of Francesco. So first of uh, going into the uh, education part, I, I want to ask you uh, your point of view, your experience about the economy of Francesco. Thank you so much. I think it, it's nice seeing people from Economy of Francesco. We were actually struggling for a year. I think it's, it's more than a year. We were trying to meet and then I was one of the participants among the 500s. We were also selected for the pre-events and then I uh, had actually the honor and privilege of getting a full scholarship from Economy of Francesco for to participate. And, and we were all excited, but right at the middle of the preparations when we were about to apply for our visas our flights even some of us started uh, actually bought their tickets and the global pandemic started and i think it was italy when I, my heart literally broke when i started when i literally uh, started thinking what would happen all those participants if they were coming to economy francesco um, and this outbreak started. It would have been a massacre for most of the participants, especially because most of the flights were closed and everything was getting shut down. So this was, my, my mother was actually saying that um, Italy is a place, it's, it's, it's one of the richest culture in the world, one of the oldest civilization in the world. But despite that, uh, see how people have been very much helpless. As, and every day I was actually, I had got friends from Italy. I actually visited Italy last year in 2019. I, I visited uh, Trieste and then in Rome, we had a, uh, I had a conference over in Trieste and then in, back in uh, the University of Rome. And so we were all excited and we were like having Facebook chats, uh, uh, sorry, uh, WhatsApp chats. We were meetings, everyone was excited, but then everything got stuck but i'm so glad i was i thought this would wouldn't happen because you know every time they were like postponing the times and and we were like very much excited that uh, maybe in two months this pandemic will over maybe in three months the pandemic will over because the time were changing you know the organizer was were rescheduling the conference but finally we could actually make it but we're still hopeful that we'll be able to Meet in 2020, uh, 2021, and, and and it was very exciting seeing Prof. Francesco's message in in Economy of Francesco's um, on on the virtual platforms, and then we had the opportunity to listen to some of the world greatest speakers like Professor Jaffrey, uh, uh, Jaffrey Sachs, and Professor Dr. Mohammed Yunus, who's who's a Nobel laureate from my country. And 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 then there are like other speakers, world-renowned speakers who are exceptionally uh, uh, doing 
uh, different types of work and are impacting people's life in many different ways. So uh, I think a uh, conference like Economy of Francesco, I actually had a meeting yesterday with, with my fellow colleagues from Economy of Francesco, and we were talking that how we were actually sharing our experiences, how we have uh, learned and how we are still connected. Uh, 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 if I'm not wrong, uh, Annalisa, right? Do I, do I pronounce your name wrong? That's correct. Yeah, so I think uh, Annalisa was from my uh, my uh, teams. We were the same, very same teams that uh, from the same pillar, actually. We call it pillar. Uh, I think, uh, are you from uh, CO2 of equality? Yes, exactly. So I was about to text actually about that we have brought other people's. Well, I think you were not present on, on yesterday's meetings. Were you? you yeah, saw I me? was the one drawing with the kid. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. So um, and it is actually fun. And uh, I was actually saying to myself and to my friends, uh, you know, the pandemic has taken a, a lot of life from Thousands of people are dead by the times we are having this conversation. But, uh, you know, this pandemic has, to, uh, has taught us that uh, um, even if we stay in home, we can all be connected. And thanks to the advancements of the technologies that has given us these blessings. So, yeah, uh, I am still working with this economy of Francesco and I really look forward for the next year's event. I, you know, every time I visit Italy, I literally felt like it's my second home. If it, it people are very welcoming. I've been to other part of the uh, of Europe, like in Germany's, in Slovenia's, in in, in Belgium's, and other parts. But Italian peoples are very welcoming. You know, it's like even in other parts in UK or in the United States, people doesn't have that mentality of welcoming people all in open arms i've got friends like as i was saying i met these people back in 2018 in, in in liverpool for a conference and we're still connected we still text each other uh, I, I even went to a friend's house and we had dinner so and i think that's the richness of cultures that the italian peoples are having and i'm really excited i hope uh, climate social uh, yeah, forums will uh, take place in person once this pandemic is over and we would love to come to Italy and maybe participate in physical di uh, discussions and we can hug each other as and thank each other that we are still alive and we are, ha are having the conversations. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, giving these opportunities. It was really lovely. I, I know my session, uh, are we starting the sessions now or? Later. No, there is a small video of another uh, uh, member of uh, the economy of Francesco from the hub of Milan uh, that wasn't uh, wasn't able to join and so send us a video. So let's see this brief video from Luca that's from uh, the hub of uh, Milan and we'll uh, share some thoughts about the economy of Francesco. Perfect. And Luca from the economy of Francesco. I'm studying, I'm a student in Bocconi in economic and social sciences. And Climate Social Forum is a beautiful initiative, in my opinion. Um, and so for this reason, I feel like uh, sharing with you a few things I learned from my experience in the economy of Francesco, and that can be useful to you too. I saw that in your values, you put the um, listening as one of the main values. And I think this is a really right thing um, because the economy of Francesco taught me exactly this, to be humble, to listen to others, to stay silent, uh, not wasting my words complaining, uh, you know, barking dogs seldom bite, can't get by on morde, right? So if we want to find solutions, better to stay silent rather than complaining. And then it taught me about um, uh, looking at my own faults before criticizing others. And it taught me that even people who have power are humans, are like me, they have concerns, they cry, they are brothers and sisters, and we, youths with a lot of energy, must help them um, 
adjust the mistakes, fix the mistakes they, they did, they made. And finally, uh, a few points. It taught me uh, that... Uh, okay, one sentence, uh, one of your slogans I, I saw is separately we have problems and together we have solutions. I think this is true, but only um, to the extent that there is commitment from everybody. Uh, why? Because, uh, you know, in a multiplication, um, if I put five and my friend, my neighbor puts zero, the result will be zero. So this, this is interdependency, right? Uh, what I learned from the economy of Francesco is that if there was a project that was bigger than me and I put 5, 10, 20, but my neighbor put 0, and then the result was 0. No point in uh, making a lot of effort. So always act together, uh, united, uh, knowing your limits. And then uh, don't do things because you feel a sense of urgency. Um, it, this can help at first metterci una toppa sopra to find a remedy, uh, but it doesn't help in the long run to find the real solutions to the problems. And there is always the risk of burning out. And finally, um, what I would bear in mind is um, that most of the change that I can give to the world comes from my daily reality. Uh, not from an association, not from uh, something that is outside of me, comes from looking at my daily reality in a different way. Uh, so, for example, here in Bocconi, I, I have the thesis uh, to write the thesis. And, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, why uh, so many students, uh, uh, 50,000 student, uh, students each year uh, graduate uh, in Milan and they don't talk to each other? when they write their thesis. I mean, it would be good to have uh, such, such a dialogue. Um, a lot of projects can come out of this. Instead, the thesis, uh, you know, the, the bachelor thesis is seen as a way to, 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 to obtain your piece of paper and move on. But it's a little bit uh, sad, right? Uh, so this is an example of change that, that you can make uh, simply in your daily reality of a student. And, um, and, and finally, don't do things because you, you are unsatisfied with something of your life. Do things uh, you love, things you love, for people you love. And have fun in dreaming a new world. It's not, uh, uh, don't, don't take this too seriously. Uh, make jokes, dream crazy and laugh. Uh, party together. Okay, don't just talk about problems, also about opportunities, share experiences, uh, connect, make a community, uh, build relationships. All the best. Okay, we heard the, the words of Luca, that uh, uh, was also a member of uh, the economy of Francesco. Uh, and uh, with the Luca, we can also start the, the next session with a message that is also a message of joy. Uh, today we are talking about uh, integral ecology and also democracy and uh, the integral ecology is coming also from the message of uh, St. Francis and one of the points of St. Francis was the joy, the joy also in facing uh, the crisis to find solution as uh, in a way um, Luca pointed out. But properly also for facing the and learn from the crisis we have to think about education. Education is a key point to uh, also uh, foster the fight against climate change. Uh, Article 12 of uh, uh, Paris Agreement properly define a framework on uh, education that is called Action for Climate Empowerment, ACE, we will learn after with a brief video what ACE is. And properly on education, I'll give the floor to uh, Nurul again, because uh, Nurul has participated to the economy of Francesco, but also it has a long experience in uh, education field and education to sustainability. So Nurul, now I'm asking you uh, to share your experience on, uh, on this topic. 
Thank you so much, Dominicas. I think um, today the world has a uh, population where 30 percent of the population, uh, half of the population, is is at the age of 30 years, and we are a generation that burdens the uh, burdens the issues like climate change, poverty, hungers, and this specifically um, this pandemic has, has actually say already explained us why we need to take the sustainable development goals very seriously. These issues like climate change needs to be dealt because we still don't know how uh, how this virus, specific virus, coronavirus, has come. Some of the, um, uh, the world experts in climate change are uh, saying that uh, these are this issue specifically uh, the, the, the virus itself has actually initiated from the effects of uh, climate change around the world so we need to emphasize whether we have actually imbalances the ecologies we have whether we have disturbed the mother natures as and 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 then you know and this is actually a, a pleasure to be sharing this auspicious days with you all so before i proceed i want to congratulate uh congratulate the climate summit forums and the platforms as where we are building new or uh, new way of thinking where we are actually empowering youth and, and and we are empowering a new ways of rethinking educations to build peaceful and sustainable societies i want to commend the teams of climate change uh yeah climate uh, yeah, social summits and and, and especially Dominicas for this focus on empowering young global citizens to be transformative champions of change. Um, you know, this year, it is actually an auspicious year for me, for our countries, because uh, we are actually commemorating the 75 years of United Nations and as well as 100th birth anniversaries of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And next year, we will be actually celebrating our 50 independence days. And I'm very glad that I have this opportunity of speaking about it to you all sitting in different part of the world. And, you know, um, uh, and, and Bangladesh as a country is one of the most vulnerable countries affected hugely early due to the climate change. It, it says that one third of the Bangladesh will emerge in water due to the effect of climate change. And so this is actually a high times when we need to, to rethink the ways of education and how we can actually impose the sustainable development goals, including climate changes in our education systems. Because this, uh, the ways uh, the world is dealing now is, uh, uh, in, in next 50 years or maybe in 30 years, uh, the existence of this country, especially is developing countries or least developing countries like Bangladesh, as uh, there wouldn't be any countries like them, like uh, countries like Maldives are already uh, thinking of shifting their entire countries to somewhere else. They're actually looking for uh, lands in some other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, if we don't take initiative, uh, and, and I would say an initiative that would connect young people, especially people from, from school, colleges, and, and universities, because these are the peoples, these are the young peoples who will take the initiative, who will lead the world in, in next generations. I still consider myself as a millennial uh, but the next generations, the 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 childrens that that are born in today's, will be the ones who will be suffering the most. And as, uh, as you know, my dear members, as our world is actually a crossroads, a juncture where we must pause, reflect, and then collectively act. You know, humanity is facing a new set of challenges ranging from this pandemic. The climate change, unprecedented migrations, migration due to climate change, and issues like mental health problems and violence and uh, conflicts. G global peacefulness has declined considerably. It is estimated that 40% of people are uh, under the age of 25. However, uh, the civic and political participation is merely uh, average. In Bangladesh itself, the age is 25.7 years. To compound the problems, our education systems uh, are not adapting quickly enough to counter and even prevent these challenging issues. 
Um, this is why we need a powerful forces dedicated to, uh, to empathy, compassion, and kindness that would actually emphasize or initiate it on how we can build this world with sustainable development and 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 and, and leave this earth uh, where people from all class and race lives peacefully, as where every children would get uh, quality education there will be a world where the hunger will be a uh, the old story and and a, and a, and a healthy peaceful uh, um uh, my dear friends then then this is why actually we need powerful forces to you ensure youth participation in building a peaceful world that we have always dreamed of and we are moving forward towards aid under uh, the current leaderships in different countries that we have but the uh, are we doing enough we have to ask ourselves are we doing enough for ourselves are we doing enough for our future generations um, um you know at this point we we have to rethink how we can actually change the course of histories by changing the course of educations and uh, because you know Innovation is, is, is a must. We need to ensure that we bring education and more interactive and life enhancing education. The education that will help every single people, which will not only benefit the, uh, the people who has good advantages, but rather uh, will focus on the people, especially people from marginalized communities, communities who doesn't have the luxury uh, to have their educations. I personally believe that education is sometimes a luxury, sometimes it is a privilege. Not every single person has the luxury to afford education. So I believe we have to make it a universal, as, as, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, education is actually a human rights. Are we actually doing enough to ensure it as a human rights? There are still millions of people in South Asia, especially in India, Bangladesh, who are out of schools. Child marriage is a huge issue due to the dropout of schools. Uh, uh, we have ensured primary education, but are we doing enough to ensure uh, uh, yeah, secondary education or higher education? And not really, especially if we if we if we see the number of girls participation. It is very low, but yes, we are actually improving. Sitting here in Bangladesh, I can tell you some stories, like uh, a proud stories, like our prime minister is, is, is a woman, our spe speaker of the parliament is a woman, our, form, our education minister is a woman, and, uh, and most, of, most of the important and chairs in, the, in, in, in Bangladesh are being held by women. But at still now there are cases, cases like rape, uh, racial discrimination, and, 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 and child, mar uh, child marriage is, is, is growing every. And you know, um, this pandemic has actually pointed us that um, the, the global pandemic has taught us that more than ever that adapting to uncertainty and learning innovatively is a must for restructuring our education system to ensure that they facilitate the new ways of learning through digital innovation. So there is no other way we can escape from digital, digitalizing ourselves, coping with new normals. Uh, you know, before our years, our new normal is to speak to someone, fly to some other places, sit in some fancy conferences, but right sitting here at this place where we are actually talking about important issues, issues like education, where education therefore facilitated and challenged the young to search deep within themselves and build the inner strength that enables them and to not just empathize or relate with the sufferings of other, but to act to lessen and, and that sufferings on the fundamental basis that like themselves, they too are uh, sentient beings deserving of dignity, respect and happiness. Uh, we also need to educate young people on the importance of critical inquiry 
and experimentation to enable them to defy and transcend boundaries uh, um, such as class and race. We need to be educated and creative to question and transfer and transcend structural injustice and inequalities. As this needs to be, there needs to be an education that builds their resilience and determinations to fight global injustices, even when their health and lives are at stakes. And, and um, this brings to my uh, uh, final points, uh, recreations of things that I have said or hinted already. Um, we are in a dire needs of many, and in Nelson Mandela's, Martin Luther King's, and, and, and many more uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's, because we need young people's, uh, because these are the people's, they took initiative when they were young, and, and their initiative has changed the world. Uh, I mean, so we need young people's who are D disturbed and concerned about injustices and inequalities anywhere in the world who are most importantly ready to roll their sleeves from uh, form into a collective a movement to build our nations and that will a world or a nations that will be free of poverty hunger and self-dependent and build a world of equal peaceful and sustainable where every being is treated equally with dignity and respects and where suffering in, is non-existence and, and, and in conclusions we need to bring youth back into the presence young people are not the leaders of tomorrow because i believe they're the leaders of today exactly now the youth are the leaders of now where we need to focus on and that's why we need to focus on them we need to give youth they deserve agencies trust in them education educate them to be like or better and create supportive ecosystems to enable them to transform their societies. Uh, therefore, not apt a gathering like gathering of youth to commemorate uh, the 75 years of, of the United Nations and where uh, climate change, because I, uh, because I was very much excited and I was looking forward to the, this, uh, to the, this year's climate, uh, Paris, uh, climate change summit, but due to the pandemic, this got postponed and but we need to be uh hopeful and we need to uh to collectively reaffirm a pledge through a gathering of concerns and we need to be kind and compassionate and youth who are determined to do better as for our common humanities is this this is actually a place where i want to challenge the youth also challenge the sunset generation, the leaders from myself to all of us here to create spaces for authentic engagement and involved of youth. And if required, we, we, we have to step aside and let them spread head social, uh, social transformations. I will actually follow this movement of making new young leaders of, for climate change. And, and I promise that I will keep supporting this is and from and as a citizens of a developing countries and a, a countries who have suffered are uh, the effects of climate change so so that we can actually see uh, the seeds that we started uh, the, the seeds that will germinate and, and grows into gigantic trees that will provide sheds for many generations to come um on these occasions and, and i pledge my full support to youngs and mem member of the uh, climate social summit um, and calling governments private public partners to create more young leaders who will devote themselves in rebuilding our worlds like we did in our old days we have seen how young people have have, have, have devoted themselves during this pandemic. Young people were the ones who became as frontliners, who were actually the first one to take initiative. They were the one. They were in the hospitals as nurses. They were um, essential workers. They were doctors. They were the ones who helped in different facilities in old age homes. So we have to be hopeful. So we must remain hopeful and firm in our belief that. Um, all challenges are surmountable, and yes, we need to continue uh, to believe what Mahatma Gandhi says. We need to be in the change that we wish to see in the world. So yeah, that brings to my last. I'm uh, sorry for uh, like making the conversation a, a bit longer, but I think this has helped you uh, help everyone 
uh, to scale up. And I hope that this will actually scale up for every single individual who has actually attended these sessions. I, I have personally worked, uh, uh, I am quite uh, passionate about education. And I am currently working with one of the UN agencies. It's called UN SDSN, uh, which was actually a part of uh, the economy of Francesco's. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sack was actually directly connected to my work. I used to work for this uh, initiative. It's called Global School Program. It, it's an initiative, joint initiative by UNESCO and and and, and UNSDSN, where we actually teach young people, especially kids uh, who are going to schools from um, uh, primary to secondary education about uh, the sustainable development goals and how we can impose educations in an innovative ways as in young peoples into their learning process so that they can actually learn how they have to Im uh, uh, impose and acquire uh, the sustainable development goals into their lifestyles, into their careers, into their personal and professional life. Uh, so mm, that would be all from my side. Uh, I, I, do, we, do we have time? Or like, shall I? Yes, we have time. Then we can also engage the uh, discussion uh, on the education that will be also with us as all. But first of all, I, I want really to thank you because uh, uh, you give also um, your proper and personal experience also in a very passionate way. And I think that this is also something that uh, we need in education, the passion for educating and also passion properly on the on the action of education. So I welcome also uh, Moran Solbrosa. A, she's a, also an expert in educational platforms and she's also supporting uh, uh, the ACE uh, working group uh, inside uh, uh, the constituencies uh, of the UNFCCC uh, as Yango as others. And uh, properly, I want to greet Sol on that and um, I will launch a brief, brief video to uh, explain also for the for the audience what uh, ACE is. Uh, that actually, as I said, is the Action for Climate Empowerment. So briefly, I will launch this video and then uh, let's uh, start a discussion. Only then you get a nice group. So, so, so we're here at SB 44 to learn and discuss on how we can create public awareness for the challenges that lie ahead of us. This group of people and the, the subjects that you represent and the issues that we represent here have been under implementation for a very long time. The question is, are we being successful? Look up. There I am. I am the sky. This is not just a PR thing. You know, the communication and education of the world and engaging people is how we will be able to move beyond individual brilliant, wonderful campaigns. Look at the ones we have just seen. But how do we turn this into profound societal change? On one hand, we want to uh, share some best practices, but we also really want to make the step further to think about how can we enhance this action for climate empowerment? What are some concrete examples that we uh, could implement? Coming to the global scale of local action, I would again say that the key is inclusion. The inclusion of non-state actors as laid down in the Paris Agreement. Their inclusion is our benefit. Based on our experience as grassroots women, it is very important that local, national government and global organization must recognize us because we know and we are agent for change in building resilience communities, uh, cities and country. My conclusion is to change our individual behavior. 
uh, whether it be that of our own, because, you know, I will certainly not be the first one to cast a stone since my daughter stands in front of my shower and says, that's enough water, Mom, thanks very much. Uh, so, you know, I think we all have uh, have, uh, have a, a possibility to, in to improve our own behavior, but also to raise awareness to uh, improve behaviors of everyone else. Finally, let me just finish with, you know, my call that I've been making to everyone since the day after we finished Paris. Swallow the alarm clock. Now starts the difficult part, to take that vision that we all agreed to in Paris and now make it a reality. So we saw in a glance uh, what the ACE dialogue is. This dialogue uh, on uh, action for climate empowerment. And the dialogue is uh, like um, one of the key pillar of the Paris Agreement that uh, is defined into the Article 12. Uh, that this is also important because uh, we can say that uh, education and uh, awareness rising and involvement also of new generation, but not only of the uh, civil society is a key pillar of the Paris Agreement. So it's a key pillar of fostering and fighting against climate change. And uh, yes, on this, I, I will give the floor uh, to, to Sol. Sol, if you want to uh, uh, say some words. Are you there? Hi, Sol, can we hear you? Can we hear you? Are you there? I'm here. Hello, yeah. hello. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I will turn the camera on soon. Um, first of all, thank you. Good morning. And uh, to everyone watching and coming to speak. Um, the First of all, the film that we just saw is exciting because it brings me back to the COP and to things that we can do with uh, education. And I think awareness is the most important thing that we can um, do to make the change. Like she said, it's about inspiring us to change our behaviors because the impact of our be behaviors is really where the climate change is coming to um, have the long-term effects that we're trying to prevent. And then um, education is the best way to do awareness. So ACE and the ACE Dialogues, um, putting it together uh, throughout the year, uh, proposals and submissions and all the content, looking after what the ministries of education will be inspired to put into the curricula is always exciting um, to learn about. And uh, there are other bodies as well, such as ECOS and um, CAN and some other initiatives from within the uh, environment of the UNFCCC, the COPS, the COIS, um, and just there are many uh, initiatives under education that are um, working to get climate education accessible to more people. And that's why I think engagement is key so that we can really get the change to the scale that we need both bottom up and top down. Um, looking forward to uh, all the information we're going to exchange about this today on the Climate Social Forum. Thank you, Sol. And uh, now, uh, I I'll make a question to both of you. Um, education is something that um, uh, we encountered a bit also in the uh, previous session, also to involve, for example, in innovation and so on. But also peer-to-peer -peer education is an important element, not only, I don't know, by um, educating from teacher to scholars and so on, but also peer-to-peer -peer is a very important point that uh, is also a key point for uh, spread the awareness and so on. Do you have some experience in peer education? How can work that for fostering the, uh, the climate change fight? 
So we can do new rule first and then solve. Thank you, Dominica. I think peer-to-peer -peer education is very important because uh, um, when an educate when we peer-to-peer uh, -peer education is connecting to each others because uh, it is quite important that we make it more uh, interactive, uh, innovative because uh, we can only make it innovative and interactive when I don't know that comes one-to-one -one education so um, uh, because but uh, but the new challenges when uh, uh, the pandemic has has actually taught us in a very different ways that uh, we need to reshape and rethink about about the process of educations so um, an interaction a personal interaction is not available because millions of pe young people are, are, are going to class or, or the teachers are teaching through virtual learnings so um, uh, peer to peer education is quite important but we need to focus how we can interact this through digital transformations because uh, as we're seeing uh, we actually don't know i think most of the school colleges uh, uh, and universities are closed in italy right if i'm not wrong yes that's correct yes that's that goes here in my country as well even two of the uh, the main uh, exams were cancelled actually here in bangladesh and the government is still not sure whether they have they need to open it because you know this has the pandemic has brought us a lot of uncertainties uncertainties of our health uncertainties of our incomes and and as of course our educations because as um, because i was having this conversation with few teachers from high schools there before i think there were yes it is where we were actually speaking to each other and we were interacting what what were the impact of the pandemic has brought into their life. So one of the teacher was very much frustrated and because he had to take uh, classes online using Zoom. So in traditionally in Bangladesh, classes are actually extremes, full of like 60, 70 people in one classrooms. So you can imagine how uh, uh, frustrating it is to take a class in person and, and, and the frustration and becomes more when it is in 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 digi digital media like zooms or google google classrooms um so the burden has increases and and more the most um uh, disturbing and challenging part is most of the teachers are not well equipped or well educated with the technologies that we have traditionalism in uh, this is actually uh, in most mostly in developing worlds where technology is actually a blessings getting a free internet uh, is, is is a blessing and access to internet is is very uh, uh, expensive here so before thinking of uh, any any sort of education we have to rethink and restructure our education systems and considering the fact that this is not the first pandemic or it will be the last pandemic that we will be facing there will be other challenges coming around you never know when the whole world will be healthy enough of when most of the uh, students will be going to school colleges and universities like before until and unless we get a vaccines and so we actually got a vaccines uh, but yeah uh, that's still in trial process we still not sure to what extent we can rely on that but we should remain hopeful and we should believe in science and yes of course as uh, so on on our our uh, inner strength and I, I'm pretty sure we can, we will all together overcome this. So, yeah. Thank you, Nurul. Over to you, Sol. Let's see, this works. Yes. Uh, and here is a perfect example of uh, what you were saying that um, with everyone learning now remotely and virtually, it's a whole nother story of engagement, isn't it? Um, for me, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, as much as we're not with peers right now, in addition to everything from traditional education to alternative education, 
Um, there's a part of me that believes in the role model system. And I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts on that. But for me, peer to peer is one of the most powerful ways to educate. I think education is actually most powerful through experience. Um, and that's the human kind of condition, part of the like reason why people didn't uh, take the warning well enough for Corona, for example, um, to me as well, it's not on my home turf, you know, it's not in my nation yet, my country. Uh, so I'm gonna continue life as usual, um, but only when it actually reaches your doorstep, do you do something about it? So when we experience something, then we understand it better. And then we are kind of fully engaged and um, I don't want to say called to action, but we can be uh, inspired into action as a response to uh, a certain situation that's happening. And to me, education, um, especially for climate change, there's a reason it's been such a challenge for so many decades for scientists to get the message across. Um, and and in trying to think of how to educate, how to bring awareness, then I believe um, it's peer to peer can be even more powerful. I and mean, even if you look at um, uh, social media, the people who are uh, called influencers are not influencers for no reason. They influence those around them. And because they're uh, they're inspiring a lot of people, a lot of people follow them, then they become influential. Um, and so if that person does something, then others learn from them. And I think that's the role model theory. Uh, bringing in peer-to-peer uh, -peer education also is a matter of perspective. So depending on how we uh, approach what we mean by peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, clearly, um, in any case, I think, you know, uh, leading by example, being an example um, of the change we want to see in the world can in itself be educational, uh, just to quote Gandhi, um, and that's part of being an inspiration, an influential person. Um, and I think that uh, that kind of education really can bring uh, a lot of uh, power to thinking about how are we going to overcome this um, with awareness. Uh, again, in my opinion, awareness is education uh, and education is really making someone aware. Um, but you can only take or lead the horse to the well. You cannot make it drink. Um, so for me, when I talk about um, education, it's not about trying to teach someone something they don't know. It's about sharing what I do know or we do know. And then it's up to the other person to drink from that well or not, if you know what I mean. So that those are my initial comments. Be the inspiration, be a role model. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you also face uh, uh, a very challenge that is uh, like e-learning because now we are uh, learning how to e-learn in a way, but e-learning has some uh, drawbacks in a way, even though it has also some potential. So maybe I will ask one thing uh, uh, on that, but before I want also to ask if the floor and the participant have some, uh, some question for you. And so uh, I will invite the, uh, the participant to eventually raise their hand and ask uh, uh, something on the topic on education on climate change. You can also write on the question and answer um, tool in Zoom. So let's see if someone has some question on the topic of education. If not, I will ask you to go in deep properly on the topic of e-learning. Uh, just a few points on what you think about this new tool or this tool that we rediscover in a way with the, his drawback, but also with its potential. If you want to start, Sol? Sure. Um, 
Okay, 100% e-learning and anything education, I'm happy to go dive as deep as you want to go. Uh, I have been researching this for at least 12 years straight, um, specifically how to create the awareness we need that will have the social impact we need in order to reach the goals of at least the 2030 um, and Paris Agreement and the SDGs, uh, but, but beyond. It's more about values and principles and life skills. Um, and in, in my perspective at this point in time is that we don't need to necessarily destroy the current educational system as it is per se, uh, which, uh, you know, e-learning also, it's disruptive to what we're used to. But on the other hand, how do we make lemonade? It, that to me is uh, how do we take the situation and make it work for us? Um, and so in terms of what I was saying earlier, um, since in my experience, or my belief experience is the best way for us to learn. I think um, e-learning is definitely a new way of thinking, uh, but I do see um, that over the last few months, um, a lot of responses that I'm feeling, I'm, I've, I've been feeling and I've heard from people actually refers to developing new ways of engaging virtually which are uh, really triggering similar experiences to actually being physical, physically close to someone. Of course, there's no physical contact um, and it's a very different experience, but perhaps um, it, we can also, you know, break through the screen a bit further into our emotions, compassion and empathy, which uh, has been something that's hard to teach yet a tool to connect people to the core issues uh, of life in general, uh, but also I think education, conversation, um, and, and again, leading by example, when we share our stories and how we deal with life, um, whether it's learning about science or math or history, or about how plants grow and how the universe works and how we breathe the air we breathe, um, uh, at, all of those things are interconnected and necessary to understand the system, the whole system's thinking so that we can be better active participants and citizens of uh, the world and, and earth. And I think e-learning, if we learn to use the, this technology that we developed as humans who developed technology, yes, we manipulated the um, natural materials and turned it into different technological things. Um, we can even have children climbing, you know, trees and taking pictures and using the technology to communicate with one another, but use it outdoors. And I think that's not um, the end of the world, but we need to uh, both open our hearts to it and be more creative to it. Thank you, Sol. So, uh, Nurul. The floor for you for uh, a few insights on that. Hello? Yes, Am I you, if you want to add your point on uh, e-learning, just a few words about uh, your point on what you think about e-learning potential and uh, drawbacks eventually. I think, I think um, e-learning is quite important, at least at this era, because humanity is facing a new challenge, a challenge that we haven't seen in the last 100 years. So the concept of e-learning is quite new to countries like in the developing countries like Bangladesh or India, and it is quite helpful. So there is this organization in Bangladesh, which is actually teaching 2.4 million people in Bangladesh. It's called 10 Minute School. If you can, uh, you can check their Facebook page. And I know there's another NGO that is actually teaching young people, indigenous people who lives in mountain, and the teachers are located in the cities. So with the uh, with the help of e-learning, uh, they are actually changing lives. They are uh, educating young people. More than more than I think three thousand kids are getting education through e-learning for the last five years. 
so yes this is actually a stories of of hope and um, and, and but the Bangla present bangladesh government has taken so many initiative of making digital uh, bangladesh because we are actually getting into a world of digitalizations uh, uh, and there is no way we can escape uh, the, uh, this new world of digital because we have been uh, uh, constantly uh, uh, evolving ourselves on this digital world and e-learning can be the next uh, schooling systems for the future world because I see my cousin who's just five years old sitting in front of a laptop and singing uh, with the help of internet uh, and following her uh, fellow classmates from her home. So there is no alternative ways. Like you see, for example, if, if, if what would be the ways of, of continuing our education if there were no internet or there were no access to internet and e-learnings? Do we have any other uh, option? At least now we don't. So uh, we need to focus, but then again, and as, as my previous uh, speakers told, that we also need to focus on our traditional learning and process as well, because that's the root of education. You know, interactions from person to person, one to one is always the best solution. But then again, since we are having new challenges, as we have to cope up with the, the new normals, and there's no other ways we can actually skip it. And 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 then different educate uh, different countries around the world, in the, mostly in developing worlds, they are trying their best to educate uh, young people. So, for example, there are a shortage of teachers. So, how are you going to engage people, especially in rural area? I saw that this documentary, this guy who lives in uh, in, in the northern part of India who doesn't have the luxury to afford a smartphone, um, but has the desire to, uh, to get education. Sitting in a de uh, developing countries, sitting in front of your iPad or iPhones or laptop, it is actually easy to tell that uh, uh, we, we don't need our, our uh, e-learning is boring. But think about the guy whose only option Okay, Nurul, maybe we have lost. lost. Okay, okay, maybe let's let's close uh, the the intervention here, and um, now we are starting the the new session. Uh, so I can really ask also the participants if they have questions. To, um, to put in the question and answer uh, tool on Zoom. So now I will stop for one moment the live stream to uh, start the, the new session. And thank you very much to Nurul and to Sol for uh, being part of this uh, session on education. And uh, I welcome the, the new speaker for the new session, Fabio, Simone and Flavia. We will stop one second for uh, uh, setting up the session and then we start. Thank you very much. It was nice to meet everyone and discuss about uh, climate awareness and education.